and we are going to be discussing all things chills, thrills, and kills. Kate and I are going to be talking about our favorite books, TV shows, and movies that are in the thriller or crime fiction genre, as well as some reading habits and other items related to how we met on Bookstagram um, that will fit in with this podcast. So thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you have fun and get totally terrified. I just actually yesterday finished listening to the uh, episode you guys did with uh, with uh, uh, Holly Sutton, right? Oh my God, anyway. And talking about that, like, that was such a great part of that, just that discussion of like what that looks like, that the kind of, you know, the shambles that the, the characters are in at the end of it. And I love how she was talking about the idea of not really like pushing back against the idea of tying things up too neatly and, and making it kind of too artificially optimistic. You know, it's like right. that, that's not how that stuff goes down. You know, people no. are with the, the, the destruction and the kind of like rubble in the wake of that. So, yeah. 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 And I mean, it's like, <laughs> nobody here is surprised that I love bleak. <laughs> like, I was just saying, it you is were my just jam. Language. Like, <laughs> it is my jam. Like, I love bleak and like nothing to anyone who's ever written one of those books. But like, I just like hate when there's like all of these traumatic things that happen to somebody throughout like three to 400 pages. And then there's like this little epilogue and it's like, the sun is shining. Like my dog's not peeing on the floor anymore. My husband loves me again. And like, everything's fine. And I'm like, no, it's not like I'm traumatized. You are. (laughs) Yes. Well, it's funny. We're talking about this because I am currently writing the second to last chapter of our fourth book. And for this, I don't know out. how this happened, but I have the penultimate chat. Well, it's the last chapter and the epilogue. Mm-hmm. And it's that moment where I'm like, oh shit, I have to like tie everything up. And, <laughs> and so I'm going back and I'm reading through like all of like just the crazy depraved shit that Greg and I have piled on these characters. And I'm like, we should just end our novels with someone like lying face down on the floor. <laughs> like humming to themselves in all of <laughs> yes how, how do these characters even walk around upright and form sentences after all of the trauma and depravity and you know so to your point Gara like I think you have to be really realistic like while still writing a satisfying ending about yeah. like what murder and mayhem does to like a human being and it mm-hmm. really fucks you up I know I'm stating the obvious but oh yeah yeah we never have happy endings ever no yeah I mean I think I was laying on the floor humming when I got to the end of the woman inside so (laughs) (laughs) it took me so long to process it gear was like I didn't even know you finished it I was like I'm processing it (laughs) she like she like slid something in like in our like text messages and I was like wait you're done like why didn't you tell me like this is like like my goal in life is to literally make everybody listen to Beyonce and make everyone read the woman inside. Like that's like literally all I'm here for. And she was like, I didn't tell you that I finished because I'm fucking depressed right now. Like I will like, when I'm ready to talk, I will tell you. And I was like, my job here is done. Like this was the best. I'm like, I read it on Christmas Eve and she's like Christmas Eve. Yeah. Oh my it God. took me some time. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Kate. Sorry. Oh no, that's sorry. okay. It was it was <laughs> worth it. It was the crazy part too was that I was watching, I don't know if you watched The Patient with um Steve Carell. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but that ending, I literally like I had like 20 pages left in your book and then my husband wanted to finish watching that Mm. show so we completely finished that show and then I finished your book a couple hours later and I was like I'm a mess (laughs) oh god I'll Venmo you some money for your next therapy (laughs) session yeah Yeah. that's a a lot of trying like trauma piled right on top of it yes that I was sobbing at the end of the patient so I I just had to take a day and then we talked about the book (laughs) understandable yeah Yeah. that that was a really powerful show it went so many places yeah so good and it was the right ending in my opinion so I agree yeah I was I was was, sorry I had not to interrupt no go for it that was one of those shows I don't know if you guys ever have that kind of experience where you're nervous like Mm -hmm. maybe like an episode out from the end where you're like how are they like you really want to make sure that they wrap it up and it's and that was so precarious the way they did it going in how are they like are they gonna you know 
pull this thing together and they did. It was great. Yeah, the writing on that show was amazing. Yeah. So good. Yeah. So good. I didn't watch it. Gary couldn't get into it, but that's okay. All right, we'll stop <laughs> talking about it then because that's no, no it's fun. fine. I listen, out of like <laughs> Anybody I know in my life, like you three are the ones that I could listen to talk all day about like whatever you <laughs> wanted, but I just didn't, uh, I didn't watch it. Okay. It's okay. Yes. If you do I'm, though, you would love the bleakness of the ending. Yes. Yeah. I do love sure. bleak, but sure. like, mm-hmm. I am just like, I'm glad that I have my shit together when it comes to like reading and what I like and like people aren't really like surprised, but when it comes to like watching things, it's like, I am the weirdest fucking person in the entire world like I will go from like euphoria to like insecure to like sex (laughs) education like I think Mm -hmm. that's like the funniest show in the entire world Mm -hmm. and then I will like continuously rewatch like promising young woman like depending on what my mood is because I watched that three times yes yeah Oh, so I can't good. it's like my comfort watch and like sometimes I'm watching it and like one of my friends may text me or like my mom's like what are you watching and I'm like promising a woman and she was like that is one of the most depressing movies in the entire world like what are you doing and I was like I find comfort in bleak mm-hmm. things because mm-hmm. it makes me sh- like see that the world's a little bleak and then I'm like it's not just me right <laughs> <laughs> It's not just That's me. <laughs> right. You cocoon yourself in the bleakness. Yeah, I do. I do. I just like, I'm like shrouded in it, like bad axe cologne. It's just like me and like the <laughs> like wafting off of you. I know. It's just like I, I'm like always like recommending things to people, and they're like, like everything you like is like so depressing. And I'm like, mm-hmm. sometimes it just makes me feel better. I'm like, you know what I mean? Like get it. Yeah. my like some days it's like oh like I don't want to go to the doctors today but in like other days it's like oh like I'm gonna have a hard time taking my dog outside because it's raining and he's a little mm-hmm. shit mm-hmm. but then I'm like <laughs> you see something like euphoria or promising young woman and you're like you know what not that bad yeah I Definitely. relate to that I think I get a lot of like needed perspective and like you know, comfort in, I don't know, there's like empathy that happens when I watch other things that are difficult to read things that are difficult. It's a reminder that like the human experience is varied. And, you know, I, I like feeling when I watch and read things and yes. for whatever reason, you know, I could self-diagnose in a lot of ways, like my psychology response to being afraid, being anxious, yes. being, you know, wanting to solve the problem. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not a rom-com girl. No offense to the rom-comers, but it's just never done it for me. No. I'm with you. I'm there too. I had I talked to Amy Suter Clark last week. And when I asked her what she likes about writing psychological thrillers, she was like, I really like exploring anger and fear. <laughs> and I was like, I have found my people. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think that those are like two like major emotions that everybody yeah. loves to read about. Yeah. You know, I love like I do love like some funny things. Like what is it? The beginning of Big Little Lies, when Madeline sees her daughter in the car with like the person that's texting and driving, and she like completely embarrasses herself by like falling on the road before she like goes mm-hmm. to yell at her daughter. Like that'll crack me up. Right. right. Yeah. That's but true. then I have to like, but then I have to watch like the War of the Roses after to like bring <sighs> me back to where I need to be. Oh, yeah. That that's a good one. Gary, have you have you you mentioned sex education mm-hmm. uh, a couple minutes ago? Have you watched this? I, I I think it's called it's like Heartstopper. I think it's called. I've been seeing that all over TikTok yeah, me too. Yeah. I am in my male male romance era, and I'm like yeah. devouring all of these books, and I need to watch it. I've heard it's really good, really really good. We just started Ooh. a couple nights ago on the recommendation of a friend that we were out to dinner with, and um, we did we ripped through like three of them right away. It's really great. It's and and it tonally it's a little bit like sex uh, sex education. It's got a little mm-hmm. bit of that kind of thing where it you know it's it's funny, tugs on the heartstrings. It's not like sappy. They keep it very grounded. And it yeah. feels very realistic, but it's, you know, it's, it's emotional and it's, and it's like romantic. I mean, it's really, it's like kind of a beautiful show in that mm-hmm. way. It's, it's good. I think, I think you would think, yeah. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Like, I think my two favorite like romance movies 
would be like there's one called weekend which is like a british movie and like at the end the first time i watched it i was like i sobbed for like an hour mm. like and usually i'm just like, like one or two like one or two tears and then i like flick them off my cheek and i move on with my life but like i like <laughs> sobbed for like an hour and i also like hysterically sob at call me by your name oh mm. yeah sure like when the father gives his speech and then like the very end of the movie like waterworks mm-hmm. I could I could be like a lottery winner or like find like seven puppies to take home and having the best day ever and like still sob hysterically at the end of that movie oh right. yeah right. so yeah. maybe I'll cry at the end of Heart Stopper. <laughs> yeah. and then I'll be like you did it <laughs> yeah. I love that I know your spectrum of ultimate happiness now, though. Yes. I mean, like winning the lottery and seven puppies, six puppies. Seven or seven. six. I feel yeah. like I'm going to be, um, oh my God, Melissa McCarthy and like Bridesmaids. Oh, yes. <laughs> where they have the free puppies and I'm like driving. Like, I mean, I've only had my dog for two months and I'm already like, I want to get him a little sister. Mm-hmm. Ooh, oh, slippery so slope. Cute. I know. I know. I've got two behind me. Mm-hmm. It might be time for you to have two. I know. Have you been have you been sort of quietly pressuring him behind the scenes on this? Yeah. this I actually know. haven't, but now I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. This is like it does uh, something help, I like because they'll play with each other. Yeah. 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 It is nice for them to have company. Definitely. I did have mm-hmm. two pugs when I was younger, mm-hmm. but oh. I had like Otis who was like chill bro like do whatever you want and then I had Phoebe who was an emotional terrorist and like she just like was like I I swear to god she was related to Satan like anything she could do to fuck up your day she would do it but she was so cute and I'm like I don't know like if I if I get a second one am I gonna have that again and be like you know what Murphy's not that bad because right now he's kind of like a little like tiny shark mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he's like a sour patch kid so I'm like you're still really cute but like <laughs> you bite my hands like I have like rips in some of my clothes he hasn't <laughs> like he hasn't like chewed on any books yet or oh. done anything like that but like you know or he'll like whine at random times if he doesn't get attention right yeah and I was like mm. like I'm, Single I'm raising dad life man I'm raising myself that's what they say right <laughs> like you like kind of like <laughs> Uh, the cycle repeats yeah yes. I know I'm like oh my god I should, I should apologize to my parents now like <laughs> taking him to the emergency vet when he was like he like was crying and whining he threw up he was like oh. shaking and I was like there's something really wrong he had a mosquito bite on the inside of his ear oh, oh god and they were like, he just has a really low pain threshold and he's very sensitive to heat. And I was like, oh my God, are we biologically related? <laughs> and my mom was like, well, now you know what it's like. <laughs> oh my gosh. Paternity test confirmed. I know, right? Yes. I'm like, oh my God, this is what they say, right? Like, I'm glad that like dogs don't have like teenage years. Otherwise, I'd really be screwed. Uh, I mean, they do, but <laughs> I don't think he'll be doing what I was doing. Yeah, probably. Thank God. Probably not. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. I don't have to deal with the teenage years or the early 20s. Yeah. <laughs> so. What has everyone read or watched lately that like completely took them away? I loved My Murder. Have you guys read that? Just no. My Murder? Yeah, My Murder, which is um, Katie Williams. And okay. it is so good. And the cover is amazing. And it's, um, I won't spoil anything, but a woman um, has come back from being murdered. <laughs> And she spends the book figuring out who murdered her and why. So it is, uh, you know, it reminded me of, and this is like a throwback and I'm going to age myself, but um, Christopher Pike wrote a book called Remember Me. And um, if you know, you know, but it's, um, it's a book about a woman or a girl who gets killed. I think she gets pushed off a balcony and she comes back as a ghost and figures out who in her friend group murdered her. And it had that same kind of vibe. It's, you know, a very different style of book, but it is so good. And it kind of straddles thriller. And I want to say sci-fi just because there's some 
element of that, but yeah. um, you know, diehard sci-fi fans might argue me argue with me on that, but that one <laughs> I loved, so I highly recommend it. And then also um I am halfway through um oh my god, all the sinners bleed, which is wonderful. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Oh, so, so good. good. I'm so listening good. it to audio on audio and it's a little rough, you know. So I'm taking yeah. it in small bites. Yeah. But yeah. It's really I read it in two days. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> my bleak little heart was like, oh my God, like, like nothing happened. <laughs> I devoured it. I feel like, I don't know, like he could write like anything and I would be like, this is really hard for me to put down. Like there's something about like, just, I've never even met him, but it's like almost like I can like hear his voice, like reading it to me. Mm. And there's just something about the way that he tells the story is almost like very like poetic, but mm -hmm. like gritty and dark, obviously. Yeah. yeah well, Greg, you spent some time with him, didn't you? Yeah. At Fest? I, I actually, I had the pleasure of meeting him at Thriller Fest this year, which was wonderful. He's a lovely guy. I got to see him on a panel. You guys will actually appreciate this because I know there's some Silence of the Lambs uh, fans in this house or in, <laughs> fans in this room. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was on a panel. This room is a house. This room is a house. <laughs> yeah. It's it not is. A home. <laughs> These panels are homes. Um, he was on a panel and he he was talking about, I think it was a maybe an audience question where somebody was asking about twists that kind of stuck with you over the years. And he was talking about the twist in Red Dragon. And so mm. at the end of it, I went up when he was signing and I just said, oh, you know, I just have to share this with you. I was in your, you know, I was, uh, uh, I attended the, the panel you were on and I grew up down the street from Thomas Harris, you know, who wrote those books. And he would, and I said, I also like you read the book when I was kind of probably too young to, and it blew my mind. I was like, as soon as you started talking about it on the panel, I, I like my head went there. Like I was living that twist mm -hmm. again in my, in my head. Um, but, and he, but he was, he was great. I got to talk to him a couple of times. He was just, you know, super humble, really like passionate about, you know, the craft and about books and very nice guy. So yeah, I, I was, I, I've been loving his books. I was um, very happy to see it on Obama's summer reading list. Yes. Oh, Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember seeing that. That was great. He curates yeah. that. Obama curates that list so well every year. I know. He does. Oh. Yes. Um, so yeah. He's amazing. I'll, yeah, I will I will kind of piggyback off of Liz's mention of that book. And then I'll add also uh, Quiet Tenant. I mean, I, I read it about mm. a month ago, but it's been living in my head. Like, it's so great. So good. Yeah, isn't oh my it? Oh, God. Yeah. Could not put it down. Neither yeah. of us could. Incredible. No. Incredible. Right. And I then, like, oh, go ahead. No, and I was going to say, also, I actually got to meet her briefly at Thriller Fest. And then I went um, a few weeks after that, attended her uh, launch party at a uh, mysterious bookshop downtown mm. and got to talk to her briefly afterwards. She's also lovely. And then, you know, you're reminded after you read that book and how beautifully written it is and how gorgeous and engaging that prose is you're reminded that like english is her second language i know, yes. you know what I mean? that's what blew my mind wild oh my god yeah 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 that's insane it's insane it's completely insane yeah and like and people just get words no matter what language it is yeah absolutely and she does i mean that it's so god the the, the rhythm of her writing and the the imagery and everything it's just so beautiful so yes. that's that's one that's been you know, a recent read that's definitely stuck with me, that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I told her, I like had been DMing her because you guys know how I am when I, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I love your book. <laughs> <laughs> but like I was DMing her and I was like, the thing that I love about that book is how if you like read through it and you only read one character's perspective, like from start to finish, they all kind of feel like they are a different genre. Like mm -hmm. the daughter is like a very coming of age. Like she doesn't really like know very much. Like, you mm -hmm. know, then there's the thriller aspect of the woman being held captive. And then the third woman almost like when I was reading it, I was like, she like literally thinks she's in a rom-com. <laughs> yes. You no, know, like they're like, you know, yeah. I'm I work in a restaurant, single hot guy comes in, he's a dad, he seems like really down to earth, like I'm going to try to get to know him, and then he's like flirting back with me, and it's like she like literally thinks she's in like an Emily Henry book. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And like that's the thing that like really 
disturbed me about that one was how like good she did with like differentiating all three of those voices and like kind of like mending together like three different genres yeah and the, and the rom-com that's a, I, I hadn't broken it down that way but the rom-com aspect that you're talking about that's a great narrative device for a book like that because you realize right that like someone who's living that you know that that experience without the knowledge of who this guy really is is going to approach it like a rom-com Mm. yeah the way she looks at it, it's like yeah this is like the dream boat that she's you know has the crush on it's like she doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes so that right. that makes sense like I don't know that thriller writers would you know normally think of that approach but it's like it is the perfect approach you know yeah and it yeah. like solidifies the believability that like he's that likable in most situations <laughs> yes yeah Absolutely. yeah yeah so good yeah so good Kate, what have you like? Loved? So I was, well, I just finished the trap mm. and oh, can't even talk about it too much because I don't even want to spoil anything, but so good and so bleak and <laughs> so sad at the end. <laughs> so Garrett and I were talking about that one forever, but the other one I was thinking that I read kind of recently was their vicious game, their vicious games um by joelle wellington and it is it's it's classified as young adult but it's someone who's just graduated their senior year of high school so it's like it feels a little bit more adult than young adult is what i'm trying to say because that's what almost kept me from reading it um but it's about a, a black girl who's been going to um a prep school with a bunch of white wealthy children or families basically and a popular girl at school gets mad at her and manages to like get her acceptance to Yale and like some of the colleges she's really excited about she gets it revoked over something really petty um but it's all this main character has wanted is like the ability to go to school there and like everything that can come from that so every year the family who founded the school does something called the finish that's what it's they, they do the finish and so 12 or 13 girls get to compete in these different challenges to have the family's backing so it's like it would be her way to get back into the school that she really wanted to go to so she's always thought it was like an academic and kind of physical challenge but she gets there and finds out that there's something different this year and basically she has to figure out how to survive with the new set of rules so there's a lot of like social and class commentary and race commentary it's very good it's really really fun Ooh. That sounds interesting timing wise too, just with all the discussion now about like legacy admissions and a lot of the, right. you know, the Ivies and mm. stuff. That's, that's interesting. Mm. How that line, lines up. It is really, really good. I feel like anyone who loves Amina Akhtar the way I do would love that one. And actually I saw Amina post about it. So mm. you like her books, you'd probably like this one. Okay. Put that on the list. Yeah. yeah that sounds really good. Yeah. I yeah. love like a campus setting too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's like, I will also say, I almost don't know how much you would love it, which I've already told you that gear, but there are, it, they, the, it is, there are some extremely pretentious and preppy characters for the sake of exact, not even exaggerating. I mean, there really are people like that, but um, it was reminding me of the characters in the most recent season of you, which I know you didn't love the characters as much, so also if anyone really likes those characters and seeing that type of person kind of like made fun of also the vibe of their vicious games. Mm. Hmm. Okay. All right. It's yeah, not, I did not, not like the characters and <laughs> I did not like the characters in the new season of you at all. I didn't yeah. finish it because of that. Really? I just stopped watching. There you go. There you yeah. go. I didn't even I like the love it. interest. Yeah, I don't know. I, I maybe just... I wasn't in the right headspace, but it just felt like the writing wasn't the same and the characters were like ugh, very caricature. I don't know. I maybe I have yeah. to go back yeah. and visit it. Is it season four? Is that the current? I think the, so. The, yes. Yeah. 
It, yeah. you, Liz, you might be right. So a lot of times with series like that, usually around like the fourth season, you get a new like writing staff on. They kind of, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes it, you, you can see a, a, a different type of like tone to it. Yeah, yeah it does yeah. have a totally different tone than the mm-hmm. previous ones. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I had for read me. that pen. Sorry. Um, I no, had read go that for it. Pen That's badgley awesome. changed the terms of his kind yes. of um, what what he was willing to do on camera. And mm-hmm. I don't want to say that the reason I liked the show so much was because of all of the like gratuitous sex. sex. <laughs> but it was interesting. <laughs> I mean, I really support any actor who wants to change boundaries, you know, based on their right. current life. And it sounds like he's married and it didn't feel like that was, you know, comfortable for him and, and where he is in his life. But I did wonder if that choice you know, created friction with the writers mm-hmm. and yeah. if adapting his character to taking out the kind of like steamy love interest, you know, sexual side of him um, ended up depleting other aspects of his character. It just seemed like he wasn't as um, complex in this season. Yeah, um, I agree with that. So I don't know. That's just, you know, my uh, thin hypothesis, but no, I think I think you're kind of right because I think we even talked about that yeah. around the time that it came out, where I was like, it does feel totally different, and he did he did change his whatever his contract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I almost feel like though there's like so many actors who have like nudity clauses that they do like body doubles for oh, like right. steamy scenes, so like that could have also been an option as well. Mm-hmm. You know, but I definitely agree with you too. It's kind of like having having a show about a character who is like a serial killer and a stalker who is just like looking for love and like wants love and, you know, like affection in all forms like that. Like it kind of makes sense to have like there be some like sex scenes in it. Mm-hmm. Nothing Especially shocks me. Especially based on the euphoria. first season. I mean, yeah. That was yeah, such a first sexually season. driven motive. That was such a part of his MO. And yeah, yeah. that was, it, it definitely changed it. But yeah. yeah. Hmm. I, I haven't controversially read those books. So I don't know how true to yeah. the, you know, adaptation wise, maybe there's part of that too. Like having not read the books, you know, so this I'm season be- wasn't even based on the books. Okay. No. So that's a part of it too. Mm. Yeah, the f- fourth one is in Massachusetts. The book. Okay. Yeah, the fourth book's in Massachusetts. Mm. And I really liked it. I really like the books. Obviously, okay. like I mean, you know, I think that um if you watch the first season of the show and you read the first book, you're like they're they're doing really well with like the voice of Carolyn Kepnes. Mm-hmm. Um, but the books just, in my opinion, like stay like great throughout the series. Mm-hmm. She's very like sh- like snarky, and I love that. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. I love like a little like snark in writing, but I also love it when you can tell that like the author is a little snarky too. <laughs> you know, like they have yeah. like a good like sense of like sarcasm and like yeah. sassiness. Yeah, my book would be so bitchy if I wrote one. <laughs> it <laughs> will be. <laughs> it would be so bitchy. Yeah, <laughs> we're looking for like, it. Yes. <laughs> be like 10% 10% murder and like 90% sarcasm. Shade. Be like on par. The tagline right there. You've the got that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. What have you read that you love? Me? Yep. You're the only one left. I am never <laughs> going to forget um Bright Young Women by Jessica Noel. Ooh, I haven't read that yet. For somebody who loves bleak and for someone who like loves like crime fiction, true crime, I have sat with this book for probably like a month, month and a half now. And I keep going back to it and like remembering things that like made my heart like like, there were times that I was like, I need to step away for a second. Like I'm like not feeling well reading this because it's very like accurate in how you can imagine people are feeling in this like situation Mm -hmm. and it is very like emotionally traumatizing throughout the entire thing is it a serial killer story it's loosely based off ted bundy okay but it's told from like the girls who survived the sorority that he attacked Mm -hmm. 
yeah, mm-hmm. right before he was arrested. Um, so I thought that was very interesting too, to, to take that story and tell it from that perspective of, you know, Ted Bundy, but like right before he is arrested, because it's kind of like, that was obviously like his like one crime that people were like, holy shit, like he's escalating to like an unreasonable amount of like time here. Mm -hmm. And it was just, she like absolutely crushed it. I can't imagine how, like, it seemed like she did so much research for it. Like she went to Tallahassee Mm -hmm. to research for the book and she must have read a ton of stuff because there was so much in it that I was like, like this has to be this has to be accurate based on like the things that she was describing and the things that were happening and it was just like beautifully written but like it emotionally Mm -hmm. fucked me up for like a while sure (laughs) which I love I'm excited for that I also love it sounds like the way you're describing it is along the lines of this sort of recent movement over the last few years in serial killer fiction with these really, really beautiful books, well-written that um, center the the victims and sort of push the serial killer more to the margins of the story. I mean, mm-hmm. like Quiet Tenant, we already talked about, Notes on an Execution, um, Real Easy. Uh, mm-hmm. There's like so many great ones that just do it so well. And it's such a high wire act to do that you know to, to write yeah. something like that, not sensationalize and do that and all of those authors have just done a, like a magnificent job with that kind that, of uh, subject matter and that approach that's one of my favorite things to talk about on here mm-hmm. yes like i am <laughs> we were obsessed. just talking about it this week yeah like i am obsessed with all of these authors who are like you know what like fuck this narrative of having you know everybody knows who the zodiac killer is everyone knows who ted bundy is but like name one of his victims like nobody could do it so like the fact that you know these authors are taking these stories and i especially love i don't even remember the name of it but there was one that they didn't even name the killer Mm. like he did not have a name he didn't have like any identifying features and there was nothing about his backstory his life like his motive there was nothing about that like it was all the victims yeah and it's just another one i love is please see us by caitlin mullen Mm, yeah yeah i've heard you talk about that one I, i have not read that yet either she has these like chapters throughout the story and it's like jane doe number one jane doe number two and it like gives you a backstory on like these women not just like how they ended up in this position but like how what they were like growing up like what their families were like like the people that are missing them and it was just so like heartbreaking but like also a really really good like reminder that you know even if you're a true crime fan you know even if you like devour some of these stories that there's like so much that is left behind even when someone's caught and someone's convicted and you know, justice is served mm-hmm. right. depending on your right. opinion of it. But um it just did didn't... you guys watch Last Call? Have you seen that yet? I don't I feel like I did, but I it's I'm, it, sure. I'm thinking of I... it because it's a really good example. It's it's a it's a mini series. Um okay. but it it honors the victims and gives background of the victims um of the serial killer who was killing gay men in New York City in the 90s. And okay. it's okay. um it's fairly recent. It's on Max, and you know it was um it happened when I was in high school, so I was in New Jersey, and I was like aware that this was happening. But you know, like most true crime, especially covered in the '90s, um, you know, it was very focused on the mo of the killer, and mm-hmm. this is also a very you know undercovered case you know, mm-hmm. because of the victim pool. And they talk about that a lot in the documentary, mm-hmm. but it is so beautifully done and effectively done that, you know, mm-hmm. the filmmaker actually took the time to go and talk to these families, you know, what is it, 20, almost 30 years later. And you get more of like a full spectrum experience of like what was happening during the times, you know, in the West Village of New York, where Greg and I both lived for a really long time, you know, during this panic of this, you know, they were calling him the last call killer, 
This was a serial killer that was picking up men in, you know, gay bars and killing them and dismembering them and scattering them around the tri-state area. And, you know, because of the gruesomeness of the crimes, people couldn't get enough of reading about that aspect, but no one was talking about who these men actually were. And I thought it was a really great example of, you know, filmmaking and, and what you guys are talking about in, you know, novels where the victims are front and the killer is kind of, you know, incidental. And you really get like a lot more, um, you know, humanity, I think, when you're talking about the people that were involved. And, it, and I, I think there's different kinds of like true crime Within true crime, I think there's a lot of different ways to tell those stories. And I personally am so glad that there's more of these stories being told from the perspective of the victims, because so much of them have been not just told from the point of view um, of the, you know, the perpetrators, but also the um, police. And one of the yeah. parts of this um, series that was really great is it was talking about how much the police were, you know, homophobic and racist. Yeah. and how that affected these cases being solved. And I think that's important to talk about too. So yeah. I read the book. book. Oh, you did? Okay, so mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, I did read the book. It took me like a month to get through. I'm sure. And it's I'm a not... very short book, but it was just, it's really like hard to read nonfiction mm -hmm. for me when it comes to that. It's like that in Highway of Tears by mm -hmm. Jessica McDiarmid. That was like heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I live like very close to the reservation in, in New York and it's like the, all of the things that people like say about like human trafficking and sex trafficking and like all of the like warnings about like people at Walmart, people at Target, like it's just insane what like is happening to like the indigenous community and it's nuts. It's nuts, especially like being like indigenous myself like it's you know like I have so many friends that live on like the Canadian side or the U.S. side and it's just like terrifying what like people are like sharing on social media about like how to be careful or like to make sure you like check for different things in your car you know like your door handle and stuff like that it's like horrifying but yeah. Jessica Dearmid did a very good um true crime book on the highway of tears Okay. So, I have to read it. I haven't read it. I definitely I'm making notes that. over here, folks. <laughs> That's me. I'm always like typing on the other screen. <laughs> yeah. In, in that sort of same vein, I'm looking forward to um, Vanessa Lilly's next book, Blood Sister. Yes. That's going to be because I know she tackles a lot of that in that in that plot. That's yes. Gonna yeah, be, that's going to be yeah. really good. I have a copy of it. Oh, you do? Okay. But I'm like, I just, I hate summer so much. I don't <laughs> like being warm. Yep. I don't like being hot. Like, I just, I need it to be like a little chilly with like something pumpkin spice in my hand. And then I can get into like the stuff that I've really been looking forward to. Yeah. yeah. I hear that. Yep. <laughs> you know, like, and I want to read that so bad. Yeah. So bad. I requested it. Sounds, it. We'll see. It sounds so good. <laughs> yeah. It's so, it really so good. There's a lot coming out this fall that's going to be good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a ton. I can't wait for book four. I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> I was just about to say we're never going to finish it because I have too many oh, books no. that I need to read. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're sabotaging I, them. <laughs> I am so patient, but like every time I finish a book by you guys, I get so pissed at myself because I fly through them so quickly. And then I'm like, oh. the waiting game yeah you know yeah as as liz mentioned i mean we are you know a chapter and a uh, epilogue away yeah. so we it's will be trying to get in the one the one i'll just throw this out here because it seems like the one where we, we are starting to talk about you know release dates and things like that and it seems like mm -hmm. the one kind of rub that's going on is uh next year fall because of the election mm -hmm. it's probably going to be pretty light in terms of um fiction titles. I think what the houses tend to do is they push a lot of the nonfiction titles that people are interested in leading up to the election. So a lot of the political stuff, you know, the Bob Woodward stuff like that. So it may be that we get bumped a little bit past election season mm -hmm. on this awesome. one. So yeah. I, hate, I, hate, I hate to tell you, you may have to wait an extra couple of months, but but we'll see how it shakes out. But we're very excited. 
we're, we're we've been having a blast with this thing. Yes. I'll talk to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll talk to them. You 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 wield some influence around here. I will try. <laughs> I will do anything. I will have like my signs made, t-shirts, <laughs> like mm-hmm. let book four out into the wild. <laughs> yeah, we'll give it to Gare. Throw, throw a hashtag in the mix. Get a hashtag involved, and it's you know it'll. it'll the take. hashtag is just give it to Gare. Like I will take care of. <laughs> I, like I will take care of the rest of your fans. But I've been like. Yeah. Do it together. Listen, I've been like standing since like art came out of the woman inside. Yeah. Well, we and we certainly appreciate that. I will say for this book, there are a couple of Easter eggs that that you'll appreciate in this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I love. I want to know eggs. like how you guys write together and like how like did you guys just were you guys friends before it? Were you like wow we could write uh we could write together and then like how do you like divide up what you do yeah do you want to kick it off Craig or sure yeah we <laughs> hopefully this hopefully the, the baton passing this answer will be as seamless as our writing <laughs> there you go <laughs> Things are going well. we so yeah so, so Liz and I actually met we've known each other for 25 years plus maybe wow. yeah is what we, we met the first week of freshman year of college in New York we were going nice. to Manhattan. We actually, at the time, we were both going for theater. Mm-hmm. And I had a theater company at, uh, shortly after we got out of school. But we also, I think both of us were getting very, very interested in writing as well. I know she and I have talked about this in various forms. I know for me, it was kind of, there was a point when I realized that the the part of the, the theater aspect that, that I actually enjoyed was more of the story aspect and not really the performance aspect Mm -hmm. um and so you know we got out of school we we were friends had been friends since then we also part of the reason i think that our friendship really took off is because we come from sort of similar family backgrounds so i think we had a shorthand the way you do with people who you know you understand where they came from how they grew up what their kind of dynamics were and it probably I would say in addition but also probably because of that we also were drawn to a lot of the same stuff you know we both liked horror and you know thriller stuff psychological suspense that kind of stuff was very much in our wheelhouse and I think we kind of you know probably sense that about one another so we grew up watching a lot of the same stuff reading a lot of the same stuff and that helped later on when we started writing together because then we had the shorthand you could be like oh what if we use like maybe we do like a little twist on, you know, that story part from this book, you know, and, and we could kind of understand that. And so, you know, from there, I mean, we started in, we, we, we have been over the years in writing groups together. We've been early readers of each other's stuff, editors, um, and, you know, big kind of supporters. And we would see each other. We, li- I think we figured out up until a couple of years ago, we never lived more than about a mile away from one another. So we would see mm-hmm. each other. Wow. You know, we we go to the movies, we go get a drink, we go out to dinner, we'd like be talking about what we were reading, what we were watching, right. and then it kind of grew from there. And I'll uh, I'll pass the baton off to my uh, <laughs> my uh, partner right now. Yeah, I mean, I think similarly to your guys, you know, friendship, it was so much fueled by being like, oh my god, I read this thing or I saw this thing, and I need to talk about it. You know, <laughs> yeah. so like yeah. I think conversation is a major tenant of our friendship and we also because we are actors together we did a lot of improv and we had this kind of like bootstrapping theater company that like you know anything could go wrong and it did and you just kind of like went with it um it predisposed us to be able to like do the back and forth style that we write in Um, And then, you know, I worked in book publishing for 20 years. So I was kind of on the other side of the desk and I was a writer, like in the closet as I was publishing. And I got to the point where, you know, somehow two decades had passed and I had a bunch of unwritten, unfinished novels um, and a lot of short stories and some plays, but I just couldn't finish anything like and part of it was is I just didn't have accountability to anyone but myself and I had so much imposter syndrome I'm like why is no one's gonna want to read my stuff you know and then here's Greg who like not only did he want to read my stuff but he was very encouraging and you know we were writing similar material so um the woman inside was really born out of 
we both had like a really, really difficult year um, separately, but we're very supportive of each other. I went through a really kind of life changing, you know, um, breakup where the person I was with was like not the person I thought they were at all. Um, Greg lost his dad to cancer. So very different situations, but we were both grappling with, you know, we were talking about before about anger and fear. You know, we were dealing with a lot of that and a lot of, you know, rage and so, excuse me, so many things out of our control that, mm. you know, we kind of kept having similar conversations about like, how do you channel this? Like, how do you create your own outcomes in like a world where there is so much out of control? And we were at a bar one night talking about, you know, writing and our lives. And I think I said, I want to fucking kill someone. And Greg <laughs> said, let's do it. And I was like, yeah. And we kind of like came up with this idea for um, the breakdown of a marriage, you know, like what happens mm -hmm. when two people are married um, and they just stop communicating to the point where like, they just both get it so wrong what the other person is up to. And it has like deadly results. And I went home and I wrote the first chapter from the point of view of Rebecca. And um, that's right. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Four books later, all the character yeah. names. <laughs> and I sent it to Greg and he responded to that email in the voice of Paul with, with Paul's chapter. And that started our, you know, baton passing. And it really is, it was like Bali. Um, so we would write back and forth and the story started to build. And, you know, back then it wasn't like, okay, we're gonna write this and get published. And then we're gonna write three more books together or 10 more books together. It was like, what the fuck is he gonna write next? That's gonna make wow. me stare at the computer screen and like curse him and, and like fire all my neurons to be like, what can I write next that is just absolutely going to top this? So it became this like pissing contest. Um, and I, I, I always that. knew when it was like a job well done when he would like text me, like you can go fuck yourself for the like, you <laughs> weekend. Yes. Um, you know, it's like trying to elicit the biggest response. And that was how we wrote The Woman Inside. You know, we just went back and forth and this story emerged and it was nuts. And the characters are completely deplorable and flawed, but they came out of like anger and rage. Um, so that that was how the first one went. So then we kind of, with, with each book thereafter, we would refine based on, you know, like what the circumstances needed. So with our second book, we needed to have an outline because then we had a deadline. Um, uh, yeah. And, but we still did back and forth alternating perspectives. Um, and then, yeah, for the third one, we wrote that at the height of the pandemic. So it was the first time in our entire friendship and certainly in our writing relationship that we couldn't be in the same room. Mm. And that was weird but it was really powerful because it was an escape hatch of like the complete craziness of that time. Yeah. Um, and then this book, we're in different States. It's the first time in our lives that we've lived far apart from each other, but we do zooms once a week and we talk nice. and nice. each other's chapters. So, so we're making it work. <laughs> and, and you'll be, and you'll be relieved to hear that the, uh, the, you know, uh, texts back and forth have not abated. I believe the last, chapter that Liz sent me was followed by me texting her this is the time when I go ahead and tell you to fuck right off yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so that's still that's that. still that still is the the engine that fuels us is the kind yes. of throwing curveballs at each other and just seeing you know what we can kind of elicit response right. from the other and uh, there's, and there's a lot of meme oh. action like if we have good yes. we have some like memes that you know are are critical and like aff affirming that you've done a good chapter so yeah. big yeah. memes are like the pinnacle of communication. Yeah. So 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. you guys, I love that. And it, so you get, it reminds me of like, I don't know if any of you did this, but like when you're in elementary school, like sometimes you do that where like someone writes a paragraph and then you just pass it back and forth. Yes. That was something I did like when I was really young and I had not thought about that, like challenge or game or whatever in the longest time. 
until you said that. And my mind is just like blown. I'm like, what could happen with that kind of dynamic? Well, we know what happens with that dynamic, <laughs> um, but my mind's just blown. I think that is so cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And it's almost like, I love how with the woman inside, it was almost like you had like the friendship version of like Paul and Rebecca, because you were mm-hmm. like, what the fuck is he going to do next? And then like, yes. Greg's right. like, Greg's like, is she going to fuck up my weekend? Like what's going <laughs> to happen? Here? And she did often. Now the kind of delicious irony, I'm probably misusing irony. I, I'm always... <laughs> you know paranoid that I'm just ruining that uh definition me too about. actually I've never heard anyone else say that nobody really knows what it means nobody knows I know you know? I mean the song ironic isn't actually ironic you know what right. I mean right. the things right. that she talks about in the song aren't actually irony I mean so anyway but the 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 and Liz and I actually talked about that afterwards sort of in hindsight we realized that we were writing this book about these people in a relationship where the communication is just crumbling and breaking down but we're writing it together. So our communication had to be very, very like locked in for that mm-hmm. whole process and continues mm-hmm. to have to be, but you're right too. It's like, we kind of had the friendship version of that. I hadn't and thought about it that way, but it's great. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it, it's both things. It's both, we, we have to be very, very locked in. And also you're right. It's like, it's sort of a bit of a mirror of what our, you know, friendship has been. Yeah. Yeah. That is so yeah. cool. And it's kind of like, there's, there's so many like horrifying things that can happen in a relationship that people don't think about, you know, like miscommunication or just being like, fuck it. Like I give up, like he can do whatever he wants or she can do whatever she wants. And there's always that like extreme fear where I think like a relationship gets very dangerous where you have one person who's like, how do you get rid of someone who like just won't fuck off? And like, how do you hold on to someone who's telling you to fuck off? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Like, that's like my favorite, like toxic thing in like a relationship. Sure. And it's, yeah. and it's such a compelling story, you know, aspect of that. Yeah. Thing. Just, just those, those sort of eccentricities of human nature are so compelling, you know, mm-hmm. as it's, yeah. it's like, eh. Wow. Yeah. Cause like I was talking to somebody, I mean, this was like years ago, but I was talking to someone about like a previous relationship I had been in and they were like, this guy sounds great. Like what, like, where did it go wrong? Like, was he like a douchebag or something? And I was like, no, it's just that, like, I think that there's also like this really scary thing that can happen where you like fall for somebody. And then all of a sudden, like, you can just quickly like unfall in love with them as quickly Mm -hmm. as you can fall like you little things they do start to drive you nuts and like they don't give a shit because they're like hook line and sinker and then you're just like all right see you later (laughs) but like it's just like there's like so many like weird and scary things that can happen in a relationship that can turn it toxic Mm -hmm. and it definitely makes up for like great stories like the ones that you guys tell thank you i agree with with that fun is like fascinating yeah Yeah, of like stories being about ordinary people ordinary people too where it's like the added allure is probably like oh no this could kind of happen to me if I didn't pay attention yes yeah yes yeah and I think the thing is too is like sometimes people get like stagnant you know like they just don't think that it's like oh like this person does this or might act a certain way and like it drives you nuts but then like you're just like do I just like take this with how it is and like avoid an argument or avoid like them coming back and telling me something that I do that drives them nuts or pisses them (laughs) off and then like it just kind of like snowballs from there but yeah I've always found that to be very interesting about your stories of how they do start with like seemingly ordinary people who just have these relationships that change or falter and like the way that you tell it is like like Kate said like oh fuck this could happen to me Mm. you know not me because anybody who dated me would be it's like I have so wonderful and so lucky (laughs) Jacob is in for a real treat yeah yeah. (laughs) or Jake Gyllenhaal I'm realizing Jake Gyllenhaal is probably more closer to my age bracket I mean, he's he's very worthy of dating, so I think that's okay. 
Yeah, I guess I would date Jake. <laughs> Jake I was going to say, are we like pretending like he's like, you give him a chance? Yeah, I'll give him a shot. <laughs> no, no, you know, Garrett, play it cool, man. Sexy indifference. I, yeah, I guess so. I guess yeah. so. <laughs> I used to see him around our old neighborhood. He would uh, be at Three Lives. Oh, yeah. I went to the bookstore. What's yeah, that? I used to hear the stories too about there was a soul cycle that he used to go to fairly regularly. Oh, and it, was, it would sell out because people heard he was in people it. people knew. It was always yeah. the same class at the same time, the same day of the week. And that became the thing, right? So it just, the class was just constantly rammed because they knew Gyllenhaal was in the mix. Oh That's my funny. God. I remember you telling me this when yeah. I met you guys in Vermont. Oh, yes. nice. Nice. Because I picked Jake Gyllenhaal for Paul. That's right. Oh, That's yeah. Right. Yes, right. because Paul, I remember, like, I met you guys and I was like, you know, like, well, let's be honest, like when I met them in Vermont, I was like drinking red wine when it was like 90 degrees outside. And so all the secrets were spilled, but I was like, I, so had, a, all. I had a, I had a crush on Paul. Like I, like that was like my thing with like reading the woman inside was I was like, I would definitely date Paul. I definitely see where Rebecca's coming from. And I'm also realizing that like, I'm a little bit of a Sheila. <laughs> I, I wondered if that's where this was yeah, going. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it was so like much. the perfect book for me. But I was, yes, I did. I had a I had like a book crush on Paul. Like everybody's like falling in love with like Emily Henry characters. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I think the first fictional male I would date that I read was Paul. Ooh. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I was like, I don't like, I don't think he's that bad. But then, like, when I got to, like, Rebecca, I was like, I'd be kind of pissed, too, but I'm more petty. You know, like, I'd be like, oh, there's a little olive oil on the top stair, Paul, but, like, learn your lesson. <laughs> we should do a dating profile yep. for you that has all of the things you're looking for in someone is actually a character description of Paul. Yes. And see what... Could you imagine? <laughs> and it's, like, it's really, like, Jake Gyllenhaal and Jacob Elordi just, like, fighting to the death for me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> what a dream. That would be like ultimately what it, I'm actually kind of glad that I live in like a more remote area because like my friends are always like if there were like an active serial killer or like the most like toxic man in the entire world, like he would come he would, to you. He would be like, I would be like, ah, this I met this guy and he's so nice. I don't know why he's single. <laughs> <laughs> always, we were talking last week about how because I'm the same way like I don't I don't read rom-coms only Ashley Winstead's um yeah. <laughs> just because she's that great but um it it's in like thrillers there was a book we were both read it was Night Will Find You where one of the characters like it's like oh he could be extremely dangerous or he could just be like spiky on the outside and like nice on the inside but like that's the tension through the whole book and I was texting Garrett and I was like it is really alarming how <laughs> much I'm attracted to fictional dangerous men knowing what I know this yep. does not make sense and he was like no there's nothing wrong with it and then I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to um yeah I know Kim right Artano this morning and she was saying the same thing about like how it's just fun to like have pull for a bad guy in a book. And so I was telling her that story and she's like, that's why it's fictional. She's like, you can, you can just pretend you can have fun with something that you wouldn't do in real life. And I was like, thank God you just made me feel better. <laughs> no, it's good. It could be the solve to like all of the men and women who are attracted to like malignant narcissists naturally. You right. know? And right. I relate to that in a different time in my life like the the proverbial like bad boy that's yes. just like yeah. you know sociopath that was just like yeah. before we had the language for it and that's like a very yes. real thing like you attract I think when you're like a highly sensitive or empathic person mm -hmm. you attract the villains so yes. it's much better if you can do it in the safety of your own home <laughs> Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I think I was like telling Kate like a while ago, I was like, you know, like I, to no, to no one's surprise ever, I can be a little snarky and like, I don't want somebody who's going to like cower and be like afraid of yes. that and just like give me what I need somebody who's gonna like push back a little bit. Mm -hmm. But like, that's why I'm like, this is concerning when I'm attracted to these characters in this book because they are like literally capable of murder. 
<laughs> so like if I'm in a relationship and I'm being a little snarky and he's like kind of like pushing back, I don't want him to like push me back like off a bridge. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like this is the beginning of the four of us should do a PSA, like record one of those the more you know things. Yeah. Yes. Encouraging people to, you know, get their get get this out cathartically uh with a book as opposed to real life relationships. Yeah. I, like I think a, you're right. A 30 yeah. second app spot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know about all of you, but one of the biggest things that drives me to read, you know, true crime and watch it and read thrillers and horror and watch both of those genres is it's like fact finding, you know, it's like preparation. Mm. I'm not just watching mm -hmm. these things because I have some like perverse pleasure out of watching people like suffer or or be in pain it's like there's a part of my mind that's like okay I'm watching this and one part is like really enjoying it and the other is like okay this is good to know because I'm gonna know if this happens to me you know I'm watching Silence of the Lambs repeatedly because it's like instructional you know yes. like I will never help someone move a couch into a van it's never gonna happen no you know, and I wouldn't necessarily have known that if I hadn't watched that movie at a formative age. <laughs> so That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. I've actually been like re-watching some of my like favorite thrillers and horror movies and talking to them with my friend Shelly. And I'm like, you know, like when I think about it, like some of these movies that I grew up like loving are actually like really like I think now as an adult, like I know what you did last summer is probably one of the saddest movies in the entire world. If you think about it on like a psychological level yeah. and like looking back on that, I'm like, there's like a lot of explanation as to like why I enjoy bleak things, why I haven't been murdered yet. And also <laughs> like why I love a bad boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you're right yeah I mean Ski Ulrich Ryan Philippi and I know what you did last summer was like the biggest asshole ever and I'm still like there's something there that like I just know that like he if he survived the movie he would have grown up to be a nice man mm. <laughs> and married you and married me yeah <laughs> yeah She's also very hot that helped yeah yeah that helped yeah <laughs> yeah nobody nobody gets angry staring at Ryan Philippi <laughs> yeah running running from a deranged fisherman <laughs> <laughs> but it has to be that exact scenario <laughs> that exact scenario but like it's not like there's not like total hope lost because I will say like whenever I rewatch the war of the roses mm -hmm. like I fully fully hate Oliver yeah with I all of I am like team Barbara and I don't know if it's because like I don't know if it's because I date men, but I just know that I'm team Barbara. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, if anybody watches the war of the roses and they're like team Oliver, then like, that's, that would be my step where I'd be like, Oh, I don't think this is going to be a right match. That's a great icebreaker question on an early date. You know, mm -hmm. you have to, first of all, if they watch war of the roses, then, you know, you're in Kate hasn't watched it. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, in Kate's defense, it's it's an older one, and it's you know, there's been a lot of movies since. So I, yes, you know, I know. Could just get to it because it it was a huge source material for us for the woman inside. I yes, say. that's what that's what Gears always yeah. reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, always, always reminding her of that. Yeah, I do need to watch it. It's, it's like um. Time. It's like just this reminder that I'm like, Kate, you have to watch The War of the Roses. I've just been reading so much that I watch less mm. lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say that's a good defense. 2023 has been really good for books. There have just been so many and Gary will be like, this is amazing. And then I request it and I like <laughs> get it that day. And I'm like, well, now I need to start that one. <laughs> Hey, do you have do you and your husband have shows that you watch together? Do you have any kind of like you know? Yeah. So actually, we just watched Platonic on Apple TV together, oh. which is kind of like a it's I would call it a dramedy. Um, yeah, we and watched. we just love Seth Rogen. So yeah. And they basically he he doesn't like to sit still for long periods of time. So huh. like once a quarter, he's like, I want to watch a TV show. So then like the patient was the other one that we watched, which is like totally different than platonic. But basically every now and then 
it the stars align and he's ready to sit down and watch a show. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. I'm like definitely more of a movie person now. Hmm. Yeah. Like it takes a lot for me to like be into into a show. Mm-hmm. And if I do get into it, like it's I've been watching sex education for a year and a half. Because mm-hmm. I'll watch like two episodes and then I'll take like a month off and like just like watch like movies. Yeah. yeah. New, new seasons coming out in a few weeks too. I, I'm still on season one. Oh, really? Oh I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm awful. I am awful. I'm that is my opposite. red flag. I will like cancel all of my plans and not just, write and do anything and watch something for like 12 hours straight. It's that like, is me. <laughs> I used that to is be. me. Like if I'm alone, like I can watch an eight hour season of something like yeah. in a day. And yes. I love it. Yep. I could watch like Silo. Four I watched row, Silo but... recently and could not stop watching it on an Apple TV. Apple TV is putting out some great stuff. They are for sure. Yes. Yeah, we watched Silo mm-hmm. as well. Solid. oh my gosh i was obsessed with it yeah so unique is yeah. that like the, no that's not the idris one that's hijack that's hijack, that's, hijack. that's on my list too and gears yeah. i'm watching it i only have one you episode are? left <gasps> yeah all right nice oh my god yeah you have that. to be really into like action and espionage and stuff i mm. don't 100 percent know what's going on i don't 100 percent like guarantee that i'm going to understand the ending but oh Idris Elba's in it, so I will continue. Yeah, I yeah. you know I love an action thriller, so because I love Luther. Yeah, Luther's Luther one of my favorite shows. shows. It's so good, like yeah. over and over and over again. I could. Did you watch the movie? Yes, yes. I was happy. I yeah. I really. I mean, I need to watch it a couple more times because there was a yeah. lot happening, but it was great. Yeah, I love Cynthia Erivo. Yeah. So like having them together. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, she's amazing. God. I love mm-hmm. her so much. Yeah. Yeah. She's incredible. This yeah. is giving me motivation to finish book four because there's oh, all good. things I've been wanting to read and watch. And I do, I usually don't read a lot of fiction when I'm writing because I'm like very worried about being impressionable, you know? Right. Yeah. And, um, and I usually, and for this book that we're working on now, it's about a con man. So I've been reading a lot of but you know like uh non-fiction books on that subject so i can't oh, wait gosh. to like get to this list yeah i love cons i am so oh excited gosh. for this nice yes. i am so excited for this yeah it's i've a- needed a really good one since i read look closer that's still one of my favorites of all time mm-hmm. oh, that's a good it's one so good. i have to re- reread that yeah that so was good. really good that was really good this is gonna be so twisty too like, yeah yeah, there's a lot yeah of i feel like it's a little bit different than what we've done before would you say that greg yes it is i mean one we're a little outside of that world that we did in the first three books with the detectives on long island this is actually starts in new york city and then there's a road trip they end up in florida there's various stops along the way so it's not in that same world directly there is a call easter eggs we mentioned earlier there is kind of a call back to uh women inside though which i think you guys all dig yeah. Um, yes. So it's a little bit, I mean, style wise, we still kind of have our, you know, we, we, we kind of have our calling cards, but uh, story wise, it's, it's, it is a bit different. It's been fun. Yeah. And oh, we're brother and so sister bad. in the book. We're writing as brother and sister. So oh my gosh. I love that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, so yeah. That's oh, cool. I love that. That's yeah. going to be so this good. So the good. coolest writing style I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, ex- I'm super pumped because I feel like you're like, obviously your relationship has grown since you guys started writing together and you can really feel it in your books. Like, you know, I think the woman inside is like my, like war of the roses. Like that's my number one. Like this is the book you have to read no matter who you are, no matter what you like, like this book is just the best. But like, as you guys have continued, I'm like, oh my God, like they are just like on top of their game. Thank you so, so much. So the fact that like you're kind of like stepping away from like that mm-hmm. world, but like you're like switching up the relationships that you're writing about and, you know, kind of like doing like a con man story. Mm-hmm. I'm into it. I'm into it. I'm so Yay. excited. Well, we, we have to keep our like devoted readers like yourself, like we have to keep you excited. And I think sometimes with, you know, especially authors who are writing in certain genres, like there is that push pull between like, you need to write, you know, what you're known for, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And readers are really smart. They're really discerning. You can't pander. You, you have to just write what you're interested in. So it will be interesting to the reader, you know, I think. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and especially that, I mean, in like right. psychological thrillers and domestic suspense, like the way that you guys like weave them together is just impeccable. So there's so many different avenues that you guys can explore with those two genres that you write that like, I'm going to be ready from mm-hmm. now until, until I'm no longer here. <laughs> <laughs> that until was you funny. finally find your serial killer husband. <laughs> yeah. Until I'm finally locked up in the basement. <laughs> I'm going to start doing wellness checks on you, Gare. <laughs> Kate has Probably like this not the on- first person to say that. <laughs> Kate has this like joke that she's like, you're going to get like kidnapped and like, I'm going to find you in his basement and you're going to be like, listen, like he brings me down Taco Bell. He gives me compliments, <laughs> like picks up my groceries for me. Like, I'm okay. I'll be fine. Get out of here. Like, I oh. also have a fantasy of like his friend Cindy and I have like, you know, like never talked to each other directly. So I also like imagine him going missing and like she and I team up together Mm -hmm. to find him and of course probably develop a huge friendship in the midst. And then he's like, guys, you didn't need to save me. (laughs) I'm fine. (laughs) You just pitched a really good book, by the way, Kate. I hope you're writing it. Maybe we need to write it. That's the move. That's the move. I I, I, wouldn't it be great if the two of you jumped into a, a little back and forth with the writing process. I know. That'd be fun. You're inspiring you guys are, me. Yeah, your sensibilities line. I, I feel like you guys could work creatively well on the page. I think so. Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. that Kate and I would do fantastic yeah. until the last chapter. <laughs> oh, you're right. Okay. <laughs> until the but, last chapter. We would literally have to fair. have like a choose your own adventure. <laughs> the Kate it's like do you want like bleak do you want happy like where do you want to go here because i'd be oh, like yeah. let's fucking kill everybody off like blaze of glory yeah, and kate would be like let's have, we have a like... little triumph <laughs> yes yeah well, that would be compelling because there'd be a tension in the ending and you would balance each other out so i agree you know mm-hmm. yeah that could and be i cool. and i also feel the need to say with my pointed finger that um <laughs> that even I'm though it listening. takes me a while to process bleak endings mm-hmm. oftentimes huh? it's typically with a book that was fantastic enough and also i could tell was probably going in that direction you can typically tell when it's not going to really be a happy ending yeah so like i can always be convinced that it's the right ending if it's the right ending mm. that's a good point so yeah. if we needed to kill everyone i would Okay. You, I do. You go where the story takes you. Yeah. 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 I do have an idea for a story that I told Kate. Mm-hmm. And I've been like slowly chipping away at it and trying to. Some actual like inside info is that I actually sent my prologue to Ashley Winstead. Amazing. And she was like, if you do anything in your life, it's that you're going to finish this. Nice. Mm-hmm. So, I haven't even read it and I agree. Yeah. 100%. I will try to do that in between like fighting off a tiny shark and trying to not get <laughs> murdered by like a tall hot Canadian when I'm grocery shopping. <laughs> you have a big to-do list, but uh yeah, yeah. Keep pushing. And I mean, listen, if you if you, you know, if you're up for it, if you want fresh eyes on it, I feel free to send to us. We would love to yeah. have a look at it. Yeah. I will take you yeah. guys up on that Absolutely. at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, you know what, a year from now, it's going to be like four besties writing a book together. Yeah. Ooh, it is. We'll just up the ante. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's efficient and the accountability is really good because like, I, I believe it. something for myself, but if I know Greg's waiting and I know that his like week is determined, you know, by when I get my chapter to him, it's, it's good incentive. So yeah. if there's yeah. three of you. Yeah. <laughs> I also like love how you guys kind of said like you like your characters in your books like you don't really know like even though you're plotting like you don't really know like what necessarily is coming next or like you know what's going to happen to to make you be like okay I'm going to like bring it with this next chapter and like kind of like get back at him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think it's compelling for the story because then you're letting the character drive the narrative one 
and yeah. you're not you're not overly beholden to something you know for instance with the book we're working on now we had had it reasonably well mapped out I and mean, we had chapter thumbnails where we kind of knew like okay this is generally what's going to happen we ended up actually cha- about a month ago would you say Liz we ended up kind of saying like why don't we flip a couple things so the ending that we pitched is actually not going to be what the ending of the book is you know right. what I mean and that was just be again I think the process of like living with the characters for a while being in the story and saying like okay this is going to serve the story better this is going to this is this feels a little more like how the psychology of these characters would sort of, you know, push events and how things would would probably play out. So that's kind of interesting too, just from, it's almost like as you're writing it, you're also just trying to pay attention to like what the story is, you know, right. as a reader kind of, you know, it's that reader. Yeah. Also, is this I the don't first, like, oh, an ex- sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just mm-hmm. gonna say, you know, I don't know if it's a superpower or a major personality deficit, but, I can usually figure out the endings of things as I'm reading or watching. And my husband hates watching movies with me because I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is what's going to happen. And he's like, well, how is it every time, you know? So I think with our writing, we are are kind of saving ourselves, hopefully, from doing that, you know, having mm-hmm. too much. Um, we can't like tip our hats very much if we don't actually know what's going to happen three chapters from the one we're in. So, you know, any, any like apparent foreshadowing or tells are usually not intentional. Sometimes we'll go back and we'll be like, oh, we didn't, we like wrote that thing. We didn't even realize it was going to connect to this thing over here until it did. So, yeah, it's, um, it it is kind of like an inverse choose your own adventure just in our, in our writing, you know, style. And Liz, that's an interesting that's an interesting point too, because right, it's like you're not as the writer, if you're doing it that way, you're not then subconsciously telegraphing right mm-hmm. story elements to the reader without you know realizing it. So if you don't, if you kind of don't know exactly where, where it's headed. Right. That is yeah. fascinating. I'm really good at guessing endings to things. I bet. And like movies, TV shows. I will say right now you guys are three for three. Like I have never guessed mm. an ending to your book. That's yeah. wow. Never. Thank you. Never. I'm always like walloped at the end and then like kind of like looking back and I'm like, it's like those things where you're like, okay, like they were giving me like little hints, but like I just wasn't paying attention. You know, like when I read them like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. <laughs> 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 Taking all notes on my girl Sheila. <laughs> I feel like you could give a TED talk about the woman inside. You probably at this point know more about the book than we do. I probably could. I probably could. I just think that it's like, I mean, nothing against any thrillers that have been out or that were out. I feel like my whole thing was when Gone Girl came out, Mm -hmm. everybody was doing domestic suspense gone girl like the missing wife and granted like they were all different stories but I just felt like there were so many like cookie cutter plots Mm -hmm. to domestic suspense psychological thrillers where everything was like like very similar but the endings were very different and then like right when I read the first chapter all the way to the end of the woman inside that's how I felt about that book when people read Gone Girl like when they read like the girl on the train and they were like this is the thing that's going to change the game in this genre wow. you know you. so like that's kind of why like like everything that I love in a thriller is in the woman inside mm-hmm. and that will that's be true. forever my like it's my war of the roses <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's my war of the roses which I've been watching like a lot longer than I should have been (laughs) like my parents probably thought that I was watching like the Lion King (laughs) (laughs) because I had the little tv in my room with like the little like VHS player and it was like yeah the war of the roses I was like this is like the coolest action movie ever (laughs) (laughs) little did I know the effect it would have on me as an adult (laughs) (laughs) Well, I know, Kate, I don't know about you. I know Liz from, you know, having known her, like, I know that we both were definitely watching, you know, age inappropriate stuff way mm-hmm. too young. 
Kate, are you in the mix on that too? Were you? I'm not. I'm the opposite. I had an extremely sheltered existence for the first 18 years of my life. And like, that's why I've missed out on a lot of movies from that time period. That so I'm sense. making up for lost time. Yeah. <laughs> That's why she has me, because I was like yeah. lying to all of my babysitters, like, no, my parents let me watch this. That's fine. <laughs> and like they were probably like, going home, like, oh my God. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I'm like I'm, I'm a pastor's kid. So ah, that's there we yeah, go. that's where we're coming from. <laughs> and Gareth yes. is now your literary Sherpa to yes. <laughs> you follow me. I try to like bully bully her into like all of like the like bleak books that I can but like also like trying to get her to like live the enjoyment that was like 90s thrillers like making right. her a list of like basic instinct mm-hmm. um war of the roses um what are some other good ones this fatal attraction one. fatal attraction one. Mm-hmm. Huge do you remember on, like... dead calm do you remember that one with Ooh. nicole kidman yes. mm. which one was it Dead oh. Calm. Oh my God. It's Billy Zane, Nicole Kidman. No. Oh, it's so good. It's a, it's a domestic thriller that takes place on a boat yeah. and the Ooh. whole thing. Is that oh. scene. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, that one is good. I mean, all of the, what is, uh, all of the books we, or all the movies we watched when we were working on Women Inside, all the like Adrian Lynn movies. Um, mm-hmm. oh, what's the one with Richard Gere and uh, the affair and the murder. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Unfaithful. Yes, yeah, yeah. With Diane. Lane. Oh yes. That Do you know that one? That perfor- Diane Lane's performance. I think she got nominated for that film. Yeah. Right? When she's that, just that scene where she's on the train and mm-hmm. she's having the breakdown on the train, and it's like toggling between her losing it and then enjoy, like enjoying the you know um, mm. the kind of. Oh no. oh no oh no he's frozen on the train <laughs> <laughs> he does his like hands are up in the air so you know it was like gonna be good like whatever I know. Was I know. next was gonna be good you froze at a really awesome we lost you at this yeah oh i was doing something funny okay cool yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah diane lane and I was like, oh, when he's going like this, like that, you know, like what, what he's going to say next is going to be amazing. <laughs> well, we'll put together a 90s thriller uh, movie list. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll yeah. And see what, because there's definitely some good ones out there. Yeah. 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 And I have for fall and like Halloween, I have the perfect toxic relationship, like thriller horror movie with mm-hmm. Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer in it. And it's called Wolf. Oh. And it's Jack Nicholson, like, gets bit by a wolf and, like, yes. thinks that he's turning into, like, a werewolf. But it's not, like, oh, I'm turning into a werewolf, like, corny. Like, it is very, like, toxic relationship in New York City. And it's, like, very, like, dark and moody. And, Kate, you will devour it. Ooh. Yes. That sounds fun. It is. Michelle Pfeiffer gives one of the best performances I have ever seen in my entire life mm-hmm. and like under 60 seconds with no dialogue wow okay and that makes me think of the witches of eastwick <gasps> oh, oh my god my yes that's just like one amazing performance after the next in that movie oh so my god nice. that is like one of my favorite favorite movies in the entire that's life. one i saw when i was way too young and also one i read <laughs> when i was way too young Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know it like made me not want to eat cherries for the rest of my life yeah yeah mm-hmm. funny corollary to that I, I happen to be looking at the bookshelf over there at the copy of the witches of Eastwick that Liz gifted me for my birthday many years ago wow I'm looking at the, it's one of the, the penguin classics you know the orange yeah. ones. I'm looking at it right now yeah also, you... are those penguins on your shirt? Because I've been thinking about it this whole time. Okay, cool. Love that. Certainly are. <laughs> I do too. I was like, is it a penguin? Is it a snake? I can't tell. Yeah, no, it's like penguin camouflage. I love it's like it. an optical <laughs> illusion Rorschach. So whatever yeah. you see. Yeah. <laughs> we now know we have a psychological profile of you. 
yeah, yeah whenever I, I see favorite. Greg he has like the coolest shirt like imaginable on well I it was I just, you know if, if I'm showing up for killing the tea I need to come correct you know I mean yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> well oh my god you guys well I uh, had so much fun and I'm so glad no. that you guys were able to join us and hang out with us and Thank you so give much us for asking. all oh, of the yeah. ways that like your crazy little minds work because <laughs> I never get sick of hearing you guys talk about your writing process and like what inspires you and you know I think I speak on behalf of all of your readers when we say that we are very thankful that you guys have such a good friendship and you know it yeah. really shows in your writing Thank you. Thank you. Well, and it has been a blast. Yeah. And I also let, let us just thank you for like the years of support. I mean, you right out of the gate, you were, you know, you, you got behind that book and really, you know, I mean, it, it, it means the world. Uh, that, that, well, thanks for not blocking me on Instagram when it was like Christmas <laughs> Eve and I was like, oh my God, this is the best fucking thing I've ever read. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas to me. I mean, come on, you know. Yeah, yeah. I will always think of like the woman inside on like Christmas Eve. It's kind of like my go-to. I love that. You know how like there certain people there are always those arguments around like what's a Christmas movie, right? Like, yes. Like is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Like to this day, yep. my, my sister's Christmas mo- favorite Christmas movie is still The Ref with Dennis Leary, which is basically about you know it's like oh, it's, yeah, it's yeah. so good. Yeah. It's not a Christmas movie, but it is. You know, it's one of it's those. It's a like, hostage yeah. movie. It's a hostage yeah. movie, right? <laughs> but it's like it's, you know, it's it's a Christmas movie. I mean, technically, right? So I love yeah. the fact, I love the fact that that you know, um, there are circles in which we are considered, you know, a, like a Christmas book. Like the woman inside is a is a book full of holiday cheer. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 it just reminds me of like Christmas Eve, and there was that like huge spread in Entertainment Weekly about the book. Mm-hmm like yeah. right around the time that my arc came in and I was like oh my god this is this. but I mean I can't say anything about Christmas movies because my two Christmas movies like on Christmas Eve are The War of the Roses and Black Christmas with like Margot um, Kidder for sure mm-hmm. that's that's a revisit for me every Christmas like I every Christmas 12 days of Christmas horror movies that's like a tradition in my house I love that I love that I'll have to get your list because okay. I like I just always am like people are like black christmas like i saw it and it sucked and i'm like no not any of the remakes like you have to watch the original, the original. one with like 70s vibes and like margot kidder who never puts down a cigarette in the entire movie <laughs> it's just like classic it's classic well and i just wanted to say thank you to you both because this podcast has been such a treat and it's been such a resource. I love how you talk about books and how you support authors and like my TBR stack is purely your guy's fault. So when <laughs> when I finish these last two chapters, I have so many good recs. So thank you. Oh, well, you're <laughs> thank welcome. You thank you so much. And, yeah. you guys, yeah. and you guys really are doing so you have, you have such a great dynamic and great chemistry together with this I mean keep keep it you guys are you guys are killing it man. keep doing it oh, well, we appreciate Thanks. that I know you're almost yeah. making me wonder if we should do a podcast Greg but no well, I think you should that. you should between the reading and the writing like what sort of free time are you working with that's no, a, that's a really not. good point <laughs> well we listen you can make it happen it's like what like an hour hour and a half a week <laughs> maybe yeah. Yeah, I would literally if you wanted to. I should just I leave run, it to the professionals, though. Exactly. I would run. <laughs> we'll just, you can like, just pop on. <laughs> I was going to say, we'll be, yeah. if, you, if you'll have us, we'll we'll be regular guests on your podcast. I think that's anytime. what we're going to kind of figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. I would love that. I would 100%. Right. Well, we definitely that. have to do like a Christmas. Is it Christmas or not? Episode. <gasps> yes. Let's that do that. That would be so much fun. That's yeah. great. Yes. December. Mm-hmm. Let's do that. We'll do we'll do like our favorite, you know, we'll each come with like a handful of our favorite Christmas movies and we can yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. I already t- I already said five. <laughs> 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 come up with more in depth, a little more in-depth analysis. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We can all yeah. you can always come up with more. <laughs> yes. That's also very true. Yeah. I yeah. could come up with more. And like my first 20 minutes of talking would be like the reason why you need to read the woman inside on Christmas Eve is because. Yeah. 